It's me and, and in today's video I'm continuing my look at classic albums um, from my CD collection and this is In the Court of the Crimson King by King Crimson from 1969. Um, there is a subtitle as well um which is sometimes used which is an observation by king crimson um and this is well a groundbreaking album a lot of people see it as because it was so influential um even a masterpiece um it influenced prog rock certainly groups like yes and genesis um when they were starting was definitely influenced by this album and um even you could say groups like um pink floyd though they were in the more psychedelic um rock um music area moved certainly moved over and um we can see that in metal and uh, ultimately um dark side of the moon yeah so um a bit of background um, to King Crimson. Um, they were formed in 1968 in London. Um, and throughout their career, they've gone through certain changes, band lineups, quite a lot, in fact. And there's various periods of activity and inactivity. Um, like 1968 to 1974 is the first activity then 1981 to 1984 second activity 1994 to uh, 2008 um they're active again and then um 2013 to 2021 they're active they do a lot of live um music they always have done uh, in, i mean this first year when this album came out they came on the scene really quickly got into doing a lot of live performances and were noticed um it's it's said that even Hendrix um re really um took notice of them as well that he'd seen them and uh, they were on the um bill with the Rolling Stones supporting the Rolling Stones at Hyde Park in 1969 as well um all this was like preparing them ultimately for this album um um and I should get into the actual details of the album now, I think. I've just given you a bit of background and then we'll go further into it. So, um, it's 43 minutes and 54 seconds long. And of course, this is the debut album. And after this, uh, we've got In the Wake of Poseidon 1970, which again is quite an interesting changing album. Um, but we're concentrating on this one <laughs> now this was recorded um on the um be, well between the 7th of july to the 13th of august 1969 but i think it must be pointed out that um there were certain issues with um they were hoping in fact to get the producer of the moody blues involved in them and he came along I think a couple of sessions and they just were not happy because hopefully the Moody Blues, if they would have got on the Derham uh, um, Decker label, um, but they felt they weren't happy with what he was doing with them. So ultimately it led to them producing the album themselves. Yes. And they got a deal with Island um, Atlantic, which is a great label to be on. A lot of great artists on there. Uh, Island Atlantic, um, they were willing to open up um, Island Atlantic, quite a lot of good acts, as we know. Um, now, um, it was released on the 10th of October, 1969. And of course, it recorded 
at Wessex Studio London. Um, the cover illustration, which is a very striking illustration, as you can see, which opened up, um, is um, by an artist called uh, Barry Godber. And the image we see, this real striking image, which they immediately linked to the opening track, they thought it fitted perfectly. Um, he used his own face, did the artist, through a mirror and um, and, and as, as the model for the um, painting. Um, now, a sad thing is that um, not long after the album was released, he sadly died. But his cover has become so iconic. It You know, it's one of those real recognisable covers. And there's not even um, on the front, which does happen, where there's no title of the band or anything on there. We just have this striking cover. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And of course, this cover, you know, is so um, influential in terms of recognising it. People recognised it and brought it to the attention. Um, it was excellent. A bit of, um, well, <laughs> what they did was really good because it... It, it really made their album stand out. As well, of course, the um, music behind all that, which was immediately critically acclaimed, and it, it sold. They built up a following as well with their live acts, and as I say, and how influential it became. Um, so let's go through the band. Um, these were the founding um, people of the band on this first album. So it's... We've got Greg Lake. Yes, Greg Lake on lead vocals, bass guitar. And, of course, as part of the producing, um, you know, the production. And, of course, Greg Lake, uh, effectively, after this album, uh, moves on to ELP. Though he's on the second album doing vocals. Some vocals were put in. But, effectively, he'd left by then, by the time it was released. And... And we know what happened. Emerson, Lake and Palmer, they took off in a big, massive way. And uh, you could say they, they had the influence of this album. Yeah, they were a massive group at the time. Absolutely massive. Um, then we've got, of course, the name that I think most people associate with um, King Crimson is Robert Fripp. Uh, electric and acoustic guitars. What a guitar player. He's legendary. And of course, his work with Brian Eno and everything as well. Mass massively influential. And um, it, because he was also involved in the production. Um, you know, as a, in charge of the band, he often was changing the band lineup. People were leaving. And the, the amount of musicians, quality musicians that, have worked on this band are just fantastic it is amazing because ultimately it's all about the musicians with all this it's the, what they can play um and how far they can stretch themselves i think this is what robert fripp is interested in um very much so and of course we've got we've got the what is really good is we've got all the sort of influences musical influences all coming together from these members um, then we've got Ian MacDonald, uh, who plays saxophone, flute, claret, claret, sorry, clarinet, bass clarinet, piano, organ, uh, harpsichord, uh, mellotron. Oh, yeah, the mellotron. Oh, wow. That, you can very much hear the mellotron in this. Um, no, it's interesting, the link with the Moody Blues. Uh, yeah. Um, there now. Um, also, he was involved in backing vocals, um, and on um, "I Talk to the Wind," he was a co-lead singer on that. Did the vocals on that as well? So, so I just put that in. Then on drummers, we've got Michael uh, Giles. Um, so he's drums, percussion, backing vocals, and very much involved in the production. Then we have got Peter Sinfield. 
who does the lyrics um all the writing uh connected you know he's a poet that's what his background was a poet and he started to do um these lyrics uh for the group um and also he was involved what they call illumination in other words about the stage show the lighting and all that as well as the production but it's interesting um he's an interesting character because he was a poet uh so came into doing this and then of course he went off um further on in his career to be writing pop music um i don't know if you remember there's a group called five star he wrote for them and now you'll know this one he wrote for books fizz yes he was right were well, their hits amazing but i think now he went back eventually back to his i think his real love which was poetry and that's what he um i think continues to do um but it's interesting and his poetry is a lot of great images which suit i think what king crimson were about and some great a lot of mythological kind of images and wonderful stuff yeah so um now let's go through the tracks uh, i'll give you the order um we start off with the wonderful 21st century schizoid man that's what i mean it fits that cover doesn't it perfect and this uh including mirrors uh, within this and this was written by Fripp, McDonald, Lake, Giles and Simfield so they all combined to write on this brilliant it's a brilliant track it really is it's totally it's a total introduction of how you're going to feel about the group it's not anything really that you've heard before it's it's kind of it really gets at you uh it's not a smooth introduction it's straight in there it's full of vigor that's it it's 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 a vigorous music and then we've got all the different um sounds and just it just works so well and the the vocals as well the way they uh, everything about this just works it really was then we got into i talked to the wind which is a mcdonald uh simfield composition and simfield said believe you or not on this one he was influenced by joni mitchell yeah in his lyrical work the way it's a beautiful song absolutely beautiful then we've got epitaph including march for no reason and tomorrow and tomorrow and again the structures are amazing in this you see you've got all these influences you've got the um rock even the, and the blues background all coming in but then it goes into very much jazz there's a lot of jazz rhythms as well um uh, mixed with classical and then orchestral um ideas um which he's all brought out in the keyboards and they all it is it's, it's, it's just it's, this is why you can see that um prog rock really became grounded in in a lot of these ideas and rhythms and everything about it and then that each prog rock group would develop their own um take on all this and it was all about the musicianship all about the music where they could push themselves and we get that here and it, i've gone off again <laughs> so the next one is called moonchild beautiful moonchild i love moonchild that's including the dream um uh and the um illusion i think that's why it's called yeah the um dream and the illusion um now this is written by fripp mcdonald lake giles and simfield again wonderful then on the last of the fifth um song on this is the court of king crimson including the return of the fire witch and the dance of the puppets 
And this one is written by McDonald and Simfield again. A great end, absolutely. You just can't help but just love this. You really can. It's interesting because they released um from this they released this la the last track which i found um the court of king crimson became a single i'm surprised uh i don't know i just surprised me i'd have thought the um 21st century schizoid man which would have been the single but singles were not important and you know i don't know why singles were released they're not it's nothing to do with singles really but i suppose record companies felt sometimes they had to release singles but it's really nothing to do with that it's about the album you know they were really making the album the art form as as we'd seen in the 60s um albums were seen as an art form and they were just developing that as well very much so um so it's 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 a great album for showcasing the direction that pro uh, prog rock would take and it's it's all here it's wonderful you can see why it was critically acclaimed straight away and why people still talk about this album why groups like Yes and Genesis just wouldn't be without this album. I know I keep going on, but it, it is so influential. And you can see why when you when you actually listen to it. It, it is outstanding. I've just enjoyed listening to it again today. And um, I can't put my words uh I express how i feel about it because I, it just it just takes me i just think wow you know it's 1969 it's such an influential um song wow oh, set of songs an album everything see i mean we get only words mixed up before i go here it is you've seen it anyhow at the side but there there's a close at the back you see the back there listing other tracks and this is from the original uh master edition taken and it's beautiful it, the sound quality is fantastic absolutely oh i love this absolutely love it so that's it um if you're new to the channel um please subscribe and then we'll let you know when i um put out all these videos um you can see what i do i don't i don't just do music but you look at playlists you can see all my music but i do a lot of films tv shows um with uh, often nostalgia base you know i love all these things i feel passionate about but if you like this particular video please give it a like because it gets it onto youtube and hopefully other people might enjoy what i do and um, it gets you into algorithms and all that stuff. And if you've got any comments, please put your comments down. I really do love to read your comments. And bye, heck, I'll answer them. And it costs no. Yes, bye. Heck. Uh, you can't say fairer than that. So that's it. All I've got to say is, I'll see thee. I'll see thee again. <laughs>